This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. My special guest today is Doris J. Sumner, who is the president of Empowering uh, Gender Opportunities uh, right here in Vermont, and the author of a book, a memoir, called Life at Camp. Uh, very interesting work, uh, and we're going to be discussing that and also other aspects of Doris's life and work. Uh, she is a veteran of the United States military. Uh, this is a, a month in which we will celebrate uh, Veterans Day. And first of all, I want to begin by thanking you for your service. And I think that's very important that people do that. Uh, and tell us a little bit about yourself, Doris. Well, thank you, Dennis, for having me. I'm very excited to talk about the book that is being launched this month, um, <clears throat> Life at Camp, Combating the Sexism We Tolerate and Why the Military Should Take the Lead. I spent 36 years in the Army. I joined when I was 18. And then I uh, transitioned to the National Guard, Vermont National Guard, in 1986 and retired in 2019. So I definitely had a long life in the military. Uh, serving in many different positions. The last 13 years, I worked as the diversity and state equal employment manager and it inspired me to write the book about the challenges when it comes to sexual harassment and discrimination, gender bias, and those sort of um, challenges that warriors face and how to uh, report them, but also hold the military accountable. Well, I want to note that... Uh some very interesting adjectives or descriptions, uh, pro-guard, pro-military, pro-diversity, and pro-women. That's that's a great combination there. You know, hopefully we'll get into that as, as well as uh, discussing some of the challenges that we face at this critical time. But just give us a little uh, of your experience uh, since you first took the oath. Well, I joined the Army in 1981 as a truck driver. So I was sort of a uh, what they called back then a tomboy. I liked the boys toys a lot more than the um, things that were, you know, considered girls or women things. I joined the army and enjoyed a great career and, uh, you know, was having fun. Then I came back to the state of Vermont and joined the National Guard. And instead of putting me in a line unit with being a truck driver, they sort of encouraged me to go into personal management. And <clears throat> so I went into that and I ended up working full time for the National Guard in the human resource office. And I found my uh, passion to be in training. And I did a, uh, a lot of uh, training for the full time members that work for the Guard and whatever their career um, that they were working on, they would have to go to specialized training. So I was the person that would send them to those trainings. And I noticed then that a lot of supervisors were using their military uh, leadership <laughs> tactics to try to supervise people. But when you're supervising employees Monday through Friday, there's some protocols that have to be addressed. It's a little different than soldiering or um, directing um, military personnel to do things. And so what we call soft skill, <laughs> Uh, mediation, those sort of tactics um, needed needed to be uh, worked on. So I, I found a passion in that. And then I transitioned into the Equal Opportunity Office. And um, a lot of the cases that came before me during my tenure were sexual harassment. And I, um, yeah, I felt like my background and experiences that I had motivated me to really want to make it better not just not just tend to the wounded but actually heal the wounds and so we started looking at why sexual harassment was happening and um the team that i worked with um the military women's program we came up with some recommendations and what we really saw was that it was the culture that was not conducive to equal opportunity, especially for women. In Vermont, certainly diversity uh, with regard to race or religion or ableism, um, gender identity uh, in Vermont, 
the predominant diversity characteristic would be gender. And um, um, a lot of the studies that we referenced and that we supported um, all kind of came together with the underlying um, reason for sexual harassment was the culture, was the military culture. So how do you change a culture? How do you change the military culture when it's been around for over um, you know, three centuries? And um, what we came up with was some strategies around gender equality accountability. So we change a culture by changing the demographics. And um, so that's where our work began. And there's certainly uh, a lot to say about it. So that's why I decided to write a book. There's a lot to say about trying to shift the culture in the military to be more equal when it comes when with regards to gender it's always been 84 85 percent male and in a lot of units it's 99 percent men a lot there were um up until 2013 uh there were a lot of units that were um women couldn't even join because they were combat units and until that that rule was repealed women couldn't even get into those units. But even with that repeal in 2013, there is still predominantly men that are in the military. And we know that culture is determined and the prevailing norms are determined by the majority of the makeup of the culture of the people that are in there. So that's why I uh, wrote a book about it because I think that there's something we can do to change uh, some of the things that are happening with regard to sex-based violence in the military and in our in our society. Let me ask you this, because this uh, Positively Vermont program gets uh, viewed not only in Vermont, but other parts of the world uh, and other parts of the United States. Could you give us an idea uh, of the scope uh, of uh, the military in Vermont and some examples of where uh, it has been deployed in, during your time. Any other information you can give about that? Yeah. Well, sadly, um, one in four women and one in a hundred men will experience sex-based trauma during their tenure in the military. And that has not changed in decades since the military started, you know, uh, keeping this research. And there's certainly been uh, an enormous amount of energy put into the prevention of sexual assault and sexual harassment through many programs and policies and directives. Um, the Justice Improvement Act that Senator Gillibrand had worked on for many years um, is something that she fought for to um, have sexual assault, um, the commanders who determine if there will be um, accountability, um, take them out of the line so that a qualified prosecutor can determine if charges are gonna be filed against somebody who has sexually assaulted another person. And in that realm, they are looking about changing accountability after the fact. And what I talk about in my book is preventing it from happening at all by changing the culture and equalizing the respect for what women bring to the team. When we think about the military and our nation having one of the greatest militaries on the globe, um, it is because of our structure. It's not actually because of the men, it's actually because of the structure of the United States military that makes it the finest organization around the world. And so it is the quality of the warrior, okay, in that structure that really that really makes it great. And there are so many great warriors, regardless of their sex or gender identity. And we just need more great warriors in there. But we also, like I said, need to shift that culture that it's not androcentric, that it's not male minded, that it's taking whoever is there and they're qualified for that job, that they're getting equal respect regardless of how they identify um, male or female. And so that's kind of the goal of um, the strategies that we tried to employ when I was in the National Guard and working on the diversity councils. And um, I know they're doing 
a lot of a lot of the good work, okay, is continuing, um, but we we still have work to do. <laughs> What's a work in progress, I suppose, and uh, what what aspects of, of the law govern this? Is it EEO? Is it Uniform Code of Military Justice? Is it uh, some other or state or federal laws? How is this environment governed legally? Well, um, the military certainly falls under the laws of the United States, but the Un Uniform Code of Military Justice is the, um, the the policies and laws that the military adheres to while you're in uniform and you're on duty. And um, certainly a violation of the UCMJ is sexually harassing somebody or assaulting somebody. And those definitions can be found on, on the DOD websites and the sexual assault prevention response program websites. Um, so when an investigation is done and it's substantiated that a warrior has violated the UCMJ policy, uh, it's the commanders that determine accountability for the the alleged offender, the offender that um, was identified in the investigation. And so what uh, what I lay out in the book is there's a lot of gender bias when it comes to uh, somebody in your unit, you're the commander, and there's somebody in your unit who has offended somebody um, on a sex-based offense. And there's just a, there was, and there continues to be gender bias regarding holding that person accountable. And it's frustrating for warriors who just want to do their job and be respected. And um, they report it as they're told to do. And then that process is, um, it's demoralizing, oftentimes demoralizing to report it and have all these people know about this incident that happened. And then especially in the National Guard, it's a smaller size unit. Everybody knows everybody. People are making assumptions and making judgments and taking sides. And retaliation can come in all kinds of forms uh, that you don't even recognize at first. And um, so a, lo a lot of times that really deters people from reporting an incident of sexual harassment or gender bias. It's very hard to prove that you weren't selected for a position um, because of your gender. You know, because they can, you know, the selecting officials can say, I, you know, you weren't the right person for the job. And even though you were equally qualified and the person that I hired it had nothing to do with your gender, but you can feel that it has something to do with your gender and you carry that weight. Um, you know, was it because I'm a female and they didn't want me to be in that position? And so um, it's just important that we name it, that we identify it and that leaders are proactive when it comes to ensuring that they are building their teams with diversity in mind and how important that is. And it, especially um, for women who oftentimes is seen as the anomaly when you have 35 guys in a platoon and one female and the one female raises her hand and says, what about this? She really stands out or if she makes a mistake she really stands out because she's the anomaly. And so um, we need leaders to be really um, vigilant when it comes to checking their bias regard to gender in the military, if we wanna change it. What about opportunities uh, for promotion? Uh, uh, how is that, is that governed uh, on a, I know it's merit. Uh, is it sort of a civil service basis or is it, how does that work? Uh, and how does that affect women? Well, in the military, um, there's an enlisted branch and there's officers branch in the army. They have the warrant officer branch. And so in order to, uh, you know, go up in rank, um, there's time. There's, you have to have a certain amount of time and grade. And then um, when you get into the higher ranks, you also have to have a position that you're going for, like it's say you're, you're E6 and you want to make ranked E7. The unit that you're in and the job that you hold, the occupation that you hold, there has to be an E7 position available to compete for. And what makes you more competitive are points that you can earn. Um, and you earn points by doing well in your physical fitness test, 
You can earn points by getting awards if you receive awards for um, excellent behavior. Um, and your performance ratings, your, your immediate supervisor gives you an annual performance rating. Okay, so they call those OERs or NCOERs where they sit down with you and um, rate your performance. So all of these um, accumulate into these points. So all of the warriors are on a point base. And so when that E7 position comes open, there's a certain number of people that are in, that are qualified based on the points that they have. And so how that impacts women is if you're in a unit where there's pre prevalence of gender bias and you're not given awards at the same rate as men, you're not given those stretch assignments that will give you an opportunity to get awards, okay? Um, also, uh, there's some units who um, get extra points for their weapons qualification. And oftentimes the combat units spend more time with the weapons. So they have an opportunity to um, gain skills on that. Whereas if you're in a unit that's not out on the range a lot, so you only go out once a year to qualify on your weapon, you're, you might have a lesser score. So there is a lot, although it's fair in the sense that it's about points, it's how you get those points is where gender bias can um, kind of deter equal opportunity for women um, in that, in that comp competition to get to the next rank. In terms of uh, service, uh, are, are there any restrictions uh, today on women? Uh, uh, is there a combat restriction or is there anything like that uh, that remains? Uh, no, actually the repeal of the combat arms policy was in 2013 and they had a transitional period where there was a lot of um, qualifications before they would could recruit women into the infantry or cavalry occupations and send them off to the occupational schools. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's every year it's gotten a little bit better where there's less and less, um, uh, I'd say red tape to get, to get women recruited into those positions. So all the schools are open for women. And, um, if they qualify just as any, any, uh, male would qualify, they can attend those occupations. It's really, um, once you graduate and you have that, occupation specialty, getting back to your unit, acclimating with your unit, fitting in, getting mentored and feeling belonged and supported. And, you know, anybody would want that, whether you're male or female. And like I said, um, it's hard sometimes for people in the majority to understand what it's like to be a minority until you find yourself in that position. Like you're the only guy in a room, you go to a party and all of a sudden there's 35 women there and you're the only guy and you're just trying to connect with someone in the room about um, an experience. And so, you know, for women that are joining those occupations, they, they know that there's not a lot of others like them. And so they shoulder that extra weight of fitting in with with the group and uh, proving themselves to be uh, just as combat ready and worthy to do the job as others. So um, yeah, it's it, it can be challenging, but it's also when you do find a unit where they support you and they embrace you and they they mentor you and they you know value you, it, it feels really good to have that camaraderie. Well, this, uh, your book has been endorsed by. Uh... Major General Martha Rainville uh, from Vermont. Tell us a little bit about her and perhaps uh, uh, the influence uh, a, a woman in that position had on you uh, as a member of the military. Yeah, I'm very, very proud of uh, General Rainville. And I, when I began my job as the Equal Opportunity Manager for the Vermont Guard, General Rainville was just leaving. So I didn't have a chance to work for her in that position very long, but um, I had reached out to her while I was in the job. She came to speak for us at a women's event that we held in 2011. And then in 2018, I reached out to her again because we were trying to get a bill passed a gender equality accountability bill 
to pass at the Vermont legislators with the help of former representative Gene O'Sullivan. And Martha Rainville was very generous with her time in speaking to us about how to, how to um, draft the bill because she had that experience of being an adjutant general and understanding being a commander of the Vermont National Guard, what that would look like or how that would look like as far as um, having the Vermont legislative oversight on gender equality, accountability and diversity. So she was very generous with her time in helping us draft it. The bill did not get passed. We did testify and, and um, uh, made some accounts of why we thought it would be important. Um, and then COVID hit in 2020. So we, uh, you know, it just kind of fell to the wayside. Um, but I had kept a relationship with General Rainville. And when I told her I was writing the book, uh, she was very supportive. I sent her the draft manual and she read it and has just been um, a very, very gracious leader um, and, and endorsed the book and, and wrote the, pre the review on the back. And so I'm very, very grateful for her support. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about the book itself. Uh, what it can, It's a beautiful work. It, just, it, it seems very mm -hmm. detailed. Uh, yes. Very nice cover. And, uh, maybe yeah, like cover. It. Uh, yeah, it's really something. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us well, what, what's it's been, been confined in it. I it's know been, it's been four, four years. Long. Yeah, <laughs> four years uh, it took me to write it. You know, it, it was took me less time to write it than clean it up. But because it is a memoir, and because I talk about the Vermont National Guard, I did have it legally reviewed and approved by the Department of Defense. Um, to release the information that I did in there. It's more of a personal story about my growing up. Um, you know, as I said, I was a tomboy. I, I liked the boys' toys. I joined as a truck driver. And then I find myself um, towards the end of my career as a feminist, really seeking equal opportunity for women and wanting the military to embrace feminine. And so um, I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And I talk about my issues with... Um, my alcoholism, uh, my codependency, some of the relationship issues I struggled with, and how getting the job as the state equal employment and diversity manager um, was more of a, um, a passion for me to, to get it right and to, it just fueled me to really want to solve the problem versus just process cases and say case closed and move on. I really wanted to solve the problem of why why does this continue to happen, and so um, so in the in the book it it kind of goes along my career. I talk about how I joined the military and uh, how I got out of active duty and ended up at the Vermont National Guard and and got into the job as the Equal Employment Manager, and then my uh, transition within the job of realizing that um, we've got to stop this from happening. You know, we've got to stop this from happening because the damage is so forever imprinted on a warrior's heart. And even though on the outside, they may look happy and confident and secure, there are a lot of wounded warriors carrying pain that just stays with you. And so um, it became really personal for me. And um, I'm kind of uh, one of those persons that doesn't I don't stay quiet too long and the generals kind of knew that about me and I did receive a lot of awards and I um, was on the national committee for equal employment managers. So I was very, very active both at the state and the national level on trying to um, promote this gender equality accountability as a means to change the culture and minimize sex-based offenses. And um, I, I just, you know, in the story, I just come to realize that um, well, I don't want to give away the ending, but I just come to realize that uh, I'm a, I alone am not going to be able to do it. And so it is something that um, I'm hoping the book inspires other people to become active when it comes to combating sexism. So I also I know it's a memoir, but uh, the way I'm viewing it right now, it might also be of use to someone who is a professional, someone who's a lawyer, someone who's in the military, someone mm -hmm. who's in personnel on those kinds of issues. Uh, that people face in the workplaces. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. And um, I think the picture, the artwork on the front really depicts that 
whatever your journey is when you um, graduate high school, graduate college, and you want to be an engineer, or you want to be a pilot, or you want to go into nursing, whatever your, your passion and your goal is, when you step, when you take that first step on your journey, you really don't know what the mountains in that you can see the mountains in the uh, foreground in the picture, you really don't know what kind of mountains you're going to have to climb and how tough it's going to be. And when you're passionate about something, you know, and you're at a certain elevation, you don't want to turn around and go back. You're like, I, I got to keep going. I've got to get to the summit. I've got to get to the top. And um, so I think for anybody, whatever career you're in, if you find that you're really passionate, but you're not fitting in, it doesn't feel good because you're like, I know I want to do this, but I'm not fitting in. And so we talk about how do you reject assimilation and be who you really want to be and, and live your purpose-filled life and to continue on and keep going. So I think, it, I think no matter what career you're in, this book will be helpful for you. That's great. Well, tell us uh, uh, about the launch. Uh, hopefully people might see this before the launch, but uh, a lot of people will see this after the launch. And tell us about the book launch, when that's going to be and, and where. Right. I'm going to have a celebration for all the people that helped me get this uh, book uh, here, you know, to be able to be able to sell it. Um, it's going to be November 17th at the Eagles Club in Milton, 42 Center Drive. And it's going to be from four to seven. So we'll have some social time. I'm going to read an excerpt and I want to have some questions and answers and just a celebration of the book. I will be selling books at the launch party and we hope to have the Amazon link to be able to purchase it on my website. It's all about ego.com. As soon as that's available from the publishing company, um, it's supposed to be available before the 17th of November, but definitely after the 17th of November, you can find the uh, link to purchase the book on my website. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Doris. Um, good luck with the book and we'll be in touch um, about uh, you and your organization and other activities. Uh, this is Dennis McMahon. My special guest today has been Doris J. Sumner uh, about her book, Life at Camp, uh, celebrating uh, combat uh, sexism uh, in the military and, and people who tolerate it. And we should be putting a, a, a little photo of the book somewhere there. But uh, thank you very, very much. And, uh, thank you, Dennis. For being here. And uh, we will uh, be in touch. Okay. Thank you so much. This is Dennis McMahon, and this has been Positively Vermont. Thank you for watching.